Councillor Aryan. Uh, I'm Priya Darshnina Trajan and uh, Associate Editor for Diplomacy Beyond and Plus. We are a magazine that covers issues ranging from politics to social to culture and environment. So therefore, it's great to be part of this discussion. As we know, climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our time and the consequences of the decisions that we have taken or take or fail to take are being borne by us and will mainly be borne by our future generations. Um, for all these reasons, uh, I'm pleased to introduce our uh, next session, which is on the climate change cooperation between India and the European Union, UK. And I would like to introduce the panelists for this session. I'll start with um, Dr. Manu Shashidharan. Thank you, Priya. So I'll just briefly give any thanks. I'll just give briefly introduce you. Uh, he's an expert in transport infrastructure as durable experience of consulting for intergovernmental bodies on sustainable transport and mobility. He is currently working with the University of Cambridge as a res uh, research associate in uh, infrastructure asset management to develop risk informed data centric approaches for managing critical transport infrastructure while considering wider socio technical economic and environmental implications. He was also involved in applied research projects that promote sustainable access and mobile strategy to achieve sustainable development goals in both rural and uh, urban environment. So I'd like to, I'd like you to take over right now. Thank you very much, Priya. Um, thank you very everyone for joining. Um, so as we all know, and I don't have to state that, we know that the climate change is the biggest challenge of our times but I'm sort of trying to bring in a conversation from an infrastructure perspective. Um, infrastructure being our rails and roads, bridges, electricity, dams, anything you name, which is key for our country's economy to go forward. Um, so we need to sort of, I'm, I'm trying to bring in the fact that the physical impacts of climate change, such as the extreme weather events, which are getting very frequent right now, we need to look at it, how it impacts our infrastructure as well. So trying to say that, we need to ensure that the infrastructure is climate resilient um, because that will help in reducing our disruption caused by these extreme weather events. So uh, one defining characteristic of this climate resilient infrastructure, as, as it is called, is involved in the planning, designing, building and operating in a way that the infrastructure can anticipate, prepare for and adapt to a ch changing climate condition. So how do we do that is to do with, if we are building our new infrastructures, we need to make sure that we, the decisions that we make today are based on predictions of what happens on the implications of that decision in 20 or 30 or 40 years down the future, because that's when climate risks are planning or are going to impact us much more worsely. So I think it should be made priority that a robust um, environmental assessment needs to be conducted um, for any new development um, to get a green light. So if environment is a winner, then by default, society and economy are beneficiaries of that win. And, and decision makers needs to also have this um, access to high quality data or information to sort of make that predictions. And we do a couple of work at the University of Cambridge as well as in um, Birmingham, um, looking into how we can use better data um, for informing uh, decisions on our transport infrastructure, so using satellites and things like that. But from looking at it from a climate change India angle, India has always um, sort of been making big strides um, in that aspect, mainly through the National Action Plan on Climate Change and as well as the Disaster Management Act and Framework. However, despite the fact that there is a lot of academic understanding and, policy at, and, and, and even at a policy level, um, there is a the integration of these two different plans has not really taken place at a sub-national level or a ground action level. Um, so that's one thing which I would say that we should sort of focus from an India perspective. And, and even um, UK is going to be the first co-chair of the governing council uh, that India is leading on the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, which I'm very um, excited about this coalition, which I'm sure it will bring in a lot of um, knowledge exchange and things in the right way. And, and UK was the first major economy to sort of pass a net zero emission law. So again, conversations can happen on, um, can 
UK help India on framing such similar laws on you know those kind of uh, net zero emission laws. And to address the climate change from a different aspect, apart from the infrastructure and everything, um, is the root of the problem, which is the greenhouse gas emissions in particular. And I see um, in sort of stuff like the World Solar Bank and the International Solar Alliance, and even e-mobility to be the game changer in this particular sphere. And in India, plans are ongoing to produce about 40% of India's electricity from a non-fossil fuel energy resource. So there is an intent and there is a buy-in. That is half the battle won. But when it comes to such initiatives, citizen involvement is the key. And, and that is lacking at the moment is what I feel. So, because we're talking about a culture change here. So can, can, can we make Amsterdam's um, cycling culture inspire Indian citizens? Because it was not long back, we heard about Transport for London in talks with Chennai for consulting on e-mobility and electric buses. And even Sheffield is talking about um, um, collaborating with Pune on helping them on public transport and environment. And recently, Transport for London has also signed an MOU with the Indian Ministry of Roads and Highways for an overall betterment of public transport. Um, even GIZ has a very strong and growing presence in India in sort of uh, helping in that sustainable mobility area. So there is a lot of activities happening. I think something key to tackle or something key to look at would be, uh, or an idea would be to try and see if we can twin UK or EU, the European towns and cities with Indian ones for a better climate cooperation. So what do I mean by that is finding sister cities uh, which sort of have a complementary um, culture structure function and problems and then look at a knowledge exchange between these complementary cities in a more systematic and a formal way. So we know that all these individual cities contract each other and do stuff but let's look at it from a formal perspective. Can there be um, sort of any funds that the governments can set away so that such kind of corporations are encouraged because that would open doors for not just climate cooperation from that policy perspective, but also for businesses in e-mobility, universities, think tanks, all of that. And to, I, to sort of look at it from what's happening right now, I think uh, that the EU's World Cities program is a potential framework to sort of promoting that sort of capacity building and knowledge sharing between um, the city level aspects. So that's probably how I would like to end my sort of uh, small session here. Um, final bit is to say that we're not looking for quick fixes. There's no point of quick fixes, but quick wins which have a long-term impact. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, you gave a lot of objectives which can be achieved with time. Just a few questions. Um, you had spoken about uh, data you know, being the key to making decisions. So do you think we have enough data right now and if we do not have it, um, how do you, you know, how do we plan to collect the data? So data is important because when we are sort of predicting things into the future, mainly with climate change, like in the case of what's the impact of climate change when I am planning to make more railways than roads, for example, the quality of data is very crucial when you're sort of, sort of, you know, predicting these things. And um, the use of existing platforms and online tools, um, like for example, the European Commission has developed a couple of them and support them. Um, the Copernicus Climate Data Store, the European Climate Adapt Forum. Um, so there are a lot of data available. Um, so recently, we see that the geospatial or the satellite-based um, data is gathering a lot of attention for its capability to provide reliable data in a very quick manner. And um, Indian um, Space Research Organization has certain satellites which they have set aside for climate change sort of focused areas. So I've also been involved in some of the research and development at the University of Cambridge, which looks at using those kind of data. So there is enough data, um, there is enough tools. Probably I would say there's a lot of tools. Uh, it's, but what I feel is that though you have access to the information, it should be complemented with um, development of technical and institutional capacity to manage climate related risks at, at government as well as local levels. All right. So before I move on to the next speaker, I just have one more question. Um, uh, with the SDG to 2030 targets, how do you see EU, UK, India align their climate action targets? Um, that, that's a very um, interesting question because that's, that's quite timely as well because you see that UK is the presidency of the COP26 in 2021 and India's presidency in G20 in uh, 2023. It sort of provides important platforms for these kind of uh, global actions uh, in implementing the Paris SDG agreement. 
and also the International Solar Alliance, which is headquartered in New Delhi, um, the India-EU water partnership. So there are a lot of um, sort of uh, bilateral partnerships which is happening. Um, I think there is there is a lot of inf there is a lot of intent in consolidating these partnerships for a global impact as well. Um, but as I said earlier, a formal framework for engagement between towns and cities at a local level um, would between Europe and India that would go a long way. Um, so, so there is an intention. There is a lot of actions that happening, um, and, and also the new um, the coalition on the disaster risk framework that also helps a lot. So. There is a lot of intention, but I think there needs to be a bit more of formalized ways of engagement in a systematic way. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, carrying this forward, I would like to introduce Mrs. Judith Weinberger Singh. Uh, she is um, Associate Director for the European Business and Technology Center, having gathered work experience in the creative consultancy business in both Germany and India. She has gained valuable insights into the perspectives and multi-layer challenges European companies face when entering the Indian market. So at EBTC, her role involves coordinating and managing activities linked to EBTC's programs and stakeholders from the European Union and India. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and for having me here. It has been quite interesting so far. I've been listening carefully and um, just to add on to the introduction. So I am currently, as I mentioned before, I'm here in New Delhi. I've been here for the last five years and um, our organization, um, the European Business and Technology Center actually emerged as an idea from the European Parliament um, in 2008. I should have mentioned that probably when uh, Svenja Hahn was still on the call, um, but that was uh, the, the starting point of this, uh, of this organization that really has the mandate to enable Europe-India collaboration in different areas. And our key mandate um, that we still pursue as a today not-for-profit entity is um, to, to not just focus on business collaborations or overall um, economic ties that we can foster as this facilitation agency, but uh, doing that with a particular focus on, on sustainable and, and green technologies and on solutions that are based upon a holistic perspective, which implies again, the principles of green economy, of circular economy and, um, and beyond. So that's the key target and that's also my perspective um, with uh, which I've been listening to the discussion um, because our focus is or my focus is always to kind of translate the, the regulatory and policy dimensions into actionable frameworks and structures that um, businesses can usually can eventually use and 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 uh, and um, set up actionable frameworks for themselves. That is simply put, uh, ex accessing the market in India um, more effectively um, and also providing solutions to the challenges that, that might be here in, in different sectors that address climate change. Yeah, and I think probably that's already enough for the introduction. I don't wanna to take too much of um, time. So uh, as an enabler for uh, the Europe India collaboration, how does your organization um, you know, support businesses in the sphere of climate change related to sectors or areas in India? Um, that's a, a good question. And um, it's probably, again, uh, it to an extent also responds to what uh, Manu has just shared that we do really require um, a more formalized frameworks in which we can exchange back best practices through which we can work together more effectively and, and with a stronger focus. And, and that's also the kind of principle um, on the basis of which we are working. And um, we do implement a couple of EU funded projects, uh, one of which is called the Business Support to the EU India Policy Dialogues Project. Um, and that very project has, as I mentioned before, the objective to um, to really use the ongoing policy dialogues between um, the strategic partners, that is the EU and India, in areas where there are already ongoing policy dialogues. And if we look at the current strategic partnership between the EU and India, then most of it is pretty much in line with those um, 
topics that we are discussing today, that is climate uh, change, climate action, um, as well as uh, green economy. And uh, EBTC is then coming here into the picture by really designing activities um, and frameworks where business can come together in, in, in form of clusters, for example, um, that tackle some challenges in a very demand-driven way. So we would identify what are the, the, the challenges on the ground and then how can that be um, tackled by um, joining hands and by bringing in um, what's already there and adapting it to the local, local circumstances. Um, so simply put, there are three pillars um, that are really important um, in terms of yeah, making climate change measures visible on the ground and that's the, te the technology dimension. Um, and of course, when, when venturing into India from, from Europe, then you have to adapt the technology, you have to understand in which kind of um, scenarios you can apply it and, and assure financial viability. And here comes the second point, the, the financing um, is really important. Uh, and there's still scope for improvement. So also here we're trying to build some bridges and uh, have come up with a, with a corporate finance forum um, to, to kind of map those gaps and, and ensure that whatever solutions that um, might be a bit costly at the first sight, but have a clear value in terms of um, sustainability and resource efficiency, that they also um, assure economic as well as commercial viability. And the third part is then related to business models. It's not only disruptive technologies that can solve um, climate change issues or prevent um, climate change, mitigate that, but we also have to come up with disruptive business models that, um, that can make a difference. And sometimes it means that you just take what, whatever already works um, in the particular market, in that case in India, and ensure that it's, it has a, a cleaner, uh, way of operation, it has a more impactful way of, uh, of solving the, um, the, the challenge. Yeah, and I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say. All right, uh, talking about the technology, so what role do clean technologies play in navigating and uh, do you see any concrete initiatives between the UA and India that, uh, you know, address the climate change and what kind of role do you think the businesses are playing over here? So technology is of course a key, but then they're always embedded in a very complex setting of different uh, layers, policy, regulatory, financial, um, and many more uh, parameters that come into the equation. But of course, uh, the change can be driven by means of greener, cleaner technologies. So it's really important for the European Union and India further strengthening their collaboration in this regard to jointly um, co-create um, technologies that can tackle the challenges on the ground, um, jointly um, innovate um, and, and kind of evolve the solutions as they are required. Um, in this regard, when it comes to concrete initiatives, and again, I'm coming back to Manu, sorry for that, but there are indeed already some projects that are quite um, uh, concrete in, in this kind of uh, perspective. We have the, the International Urban Corporation that also has an India chapter, and the International Urban Corporation was, uh, has emerged 2016 on the basis of this 2030 agenda. And in India, it has um, already supported 12, I believe, cities with regard to um, framing their local action plans and another seven cities when it comes to their climate action plans and has also um, established uh, so-called twinning city uh, mechanisms. So they're like sister cities from a European country and in India um, where then on, on that very basis, one can really work together at a municipal level and, and also bring in from the respective places the, um, the expertise and the technologies. So this is a very nice um, kind of initiative that we also support in terms of business involvement. Um, and yeah, I can share more information on that if you if you like. So um, according to you, uh, how far do you think sustainable development and economic growth is an emer emerging market in India? So 
Sorry, could you come again? I, could, I think acoustically I, I could not hear the question. Am I audible now? Yeah. Sorry. So, um, according to you, are sustainable development and economic growth of an emerging market like India a contradiction? Not at all. I would say it's a strategic imperative um, for emerging markets to, to really think sustainable and um, have a strong commitment to it. And India, of course, clearly um, has put in place such commitments and uh, is even leading some of that globally, like the International Solar Alliance is one very good example. So India has really made um, those objectives that also um, uh, the, the underpinning uh, components of the Paris Agreement part of their own growth um, story. And, and that's quite commendable. And that is also why, once again, um, the EU and India are natural partners, because um, the EU clearly has, and now um, ever more so because of the pandemic, made it very clear that the economic growth can only be um, can only be linked to to a path which is green, which is sustainable, which which is based upon the principles of circular economy of a green economy. And um, an Indian disregard also has shown again that this is also the vision that they are taking. Um, very early on in this summit, we've heard from the from the MLA uh, who provided his uh, inaugural address that uh, the developing markets are sometimes um, are actually uh, those who um, who suffer the most, but might not really contribute a lot to the overall problem. And I think that's exactly also why it's very important for an emerging market like India to be proactive and continue on that path. And uh, Europe and India are really uh, well equipped to, um, to join hands and use the synergies and, and do the, the most uh, or, 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 or the best that they can, because it does not only, um, and again, I'm thinking more from a business point of view, it's not only about, uh, those sometimes intangible objectives that we hear in the news that we have to reduce uh, uh, certain kinds of uh, emission values and so on. But it also very hands-on means employment. It means uh, that, you, that you assure a sustainable future um, for your economies and that's important. Thanks for giving us a perception from the business point of view. Uh, it's not something that we often get to hear, especially regarding environmental issues. Uh, so moving on, Mr. Navid Green Solutions. Uh, his core expertise is in design, development, commercialization, and policy in clean technologies. Uh, he has received the prestigious EU India Young Leaders Award at the EU Parliament in Brussels and was also nominated to the World Academy of Sciences Engineering Science Prize in 2018 in Italy. Um, he has also played a key role in many green technologies in the fields of biogas, solar, and other renewable energies. He founded Chakra Green Solutions in India, which uh, dedicates its expertise to promoting green and uh, clean technologies. So over to you. Hello, good evening, uh, good afternoon in the UK and in European countries. Uh, hi, Sujit. I see a lot of visible faces. Are you audible? Now, when you're audible, but you'll have to adjust your frame. Am I audible, We can only yes. see how. Yes, you are. Yes. Okay. So I can see a lot of visible faces, Aryan and uh, Sujit. Adam, I know. yes, I, <laughs> plenty of them I met at the Brussels, and uh, it's great that you know they are here. I congratulate Sujit uh, for having uh, you know organized this fantastic event and bringing all the right stakeholders on climate change and green economy of prime importance. Uh, well, uh, I have been on this uh, topic for nearly more than a decade now. And uh, he's mentioned the points which I also asked him. Uh, I wanted to emphasize on the similar points. See, the biggest uh, challenge we are right now facing is not, uh, you know, emissions target. Although, you know, I might sound a uh, little, uh, you know, uh, in a, uh, cynical, but uh, 
I think we may well accomplish this target, you know, if we really, you know, want to and everything is in place. But the biggest challenge we are facing right now is the land degradation and desertification and also food security. When I say land degradation, it means, uh, you know, uh, again, there is a industrialization which is in picture and uh, like textile industry and life sciences industry and then usage of water, energy, uh, to some extent emission also. And then we're talking about the uh, land use, which is like mining and use of soil for agriculture purposes. So again, which is connected to food security, again, which is uh, water, energy, and uh, chemical industry, which is linked. So there is a comprehensive uh, plan needs to be in place for this, uh, requires uh, deploying uh, innovative and also scalable technologies at the same time requires uh, you know global scale funding and financing um, so I touched upon that point and as far as I'm concerned I have been working on uh, some of the projects uh, basically I come from the uh, industrial segment I have been on the uh, you know Academy of Sciences for eight years uh, recently, uh, because of short of time, I have uh, not been active there. And, and uh, right now, I would like to work with uh, various uh, stakeholders, such as uh, researchers and technology technocrats and civil society uh, for the exchange of information and technology transfer and identifying the right solutions. That is my priority. Yes, Priya. All right. All right. So um, maybe you can give us an idea about the G and finance post uh, the Paris Agreement. See, uh, I'm have not having uh, uh, exact knowledge about the legal framework about the financing, which has not been uh, uh, agreed on a broad basis. Uh, you obviously you know that one of the uh, uh, countries which is a party was has not come on board which they recently have come on board uh, a few, couple of weeks ago so we have to see how that will play out and uh, there was a 500 billion dollar us dollars uh, you know promise which was made at the time of negotiations and uh, the disbursement mechanism was not decided so probably this year, I think in the UK, COP26, it is very critical how countries like India, which has actually uh, voluntarily uh, you know, committed and also went ahead uh, implementing the, its target of limiting 1.5 degrees centigrade and emissions before pre-industrial levels. And I think we are going to meet our target by 2030. Uh, but I, having said that, the biggest challenge, uh, you know, that uh, countries like India are facing uh, is that we have to maintain a sustainable development and we have to meet our climate action plan. And, uh, you know, bringing the uh, investments and finance uh, is a big challenge. So, therefore, uh, this, I think I congratulate Sujit that, you know, he has clubbed green economy and climate change, which is very much apt. In fact, he, uh, I think his team was asking me that, uh, you know, uh, what should be the you know, dialogue. So I said it can't be separated. <laughs> so uh, the climate change is economy, actually. And it has to be a green economy, circular economy, blue economy. There is no single idea which uh, we can, you know, uh, uh, meet our objectives. The entire uh, economic system on various market principles such as, uh, you know, uh, fisheries or, you know, rivers, water, uh, water conservation, uh, you know, uh, organic farming, say, you know, minimizing chemical fertilizers, textile industry, which is one of the biggest, uh, you know, uh, uh, source of uh, pollution, uh, which comes into the food cycle and also oceans. Uh, I think the other uh, panelist was there, Kaushal, he was working on biopackaging. I think that is also one of the great area we can look at solutions. So what we need here is huge investment and uh, the entrepreneurs and the industrial uh, solutions and the investment is the only way we can uh, go forward. 
and the economy has to be completely uh, aligned with the uh, you know the various mechanisms the honorable member was mentioning about the carbon trading and green bonds but again uh, these are or uh, intermittent mechanisms of financing uh, we need a primary source of mechanism which is uh, primary from investors and banks so yeah so uh, with the constant um changing dynamics of the market principles uh, what is the role of india and the eu in it uh yes that's a very very good question uh, priya and uh, in fact uh, that question should be put to the member of parliament <laughs> but uh, however uh, i actually not coming from a political background but with my limited knowledge of uh, my time which i spent in uh, eu i traveled about seven to eight countries uh, i didn't had the opportunity to go to uk uh, what i have uh, understood is there is a big scope for a technology transfer not in every sphere of life uh, but largely on the industrialized world which is like factories you can say 4.0 uh, production uh, you can say artificial intelligence uh, which is actually uh, high end automation which can save our uh, you know uh, resources and increase our productivity uh, so there you can play a huge role in technology transfer and uh, partnership in uh, industry partnership the second would be uh, in terms of engaging civil society uh, i would not hesitate to uh, say that you know the climate change uh, has been so far largely you know on uh, on a political mode i think it's time now that uh, india eu and you know or india uk collaboration comes on the pragmatic and rational that you know we have to find solutions so far there was a big uh, you know over the last 3 or 4 decades we were engaged in the you know uh, controversial uh, dialogue as to you know what would be the source of energy the fossil fuel or nuclear energy or you know or do, you know what would be the disadvantages of uh, you know renewable energy i think we are actually cross that era we don't uh, have any luxury on such debates so now mm-hmm. because we already actually in climate change and uh, uh, if you you have seen the climate change report ipcc in 2019 by 2050 we may actually see 1.5 degree centigrade increase in temperature in global average so that will hit hard uh, tropical climates like india or africa and uh, you know, in other asian countries where the majority of the population is therefore in this context i think uh, multilateral frameworks and collaboration is the only way and uk being a biggest trading partner for india because india is is the biggest trading partner uk and is also india is the biggest investor source of investor in uk so therefore it's a primate importance europe in general uh, we have uh, i think there's lot of potential there's a uh, the member of parliament from germany mentioned about free trade agreement unfortunately it has not you know gone further i think it was on back burner for too long so now i think it has to be taken on the front stage because india has already demonstrated itself uh you know meeting global challenges that it can take on on uh, taking on the global emergency situations such as you know we have seen health grounds and pandemics and climate change we have demonstrated in last 7 years and it's time that you know the 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 eu and india extends a cooperation to fight uh, these challenges i think so we need uh, cooperation at various levels one is the knowledge exchange and then on the institutional level and uh, the i think there was also one more point mentioned by uh, shashi dharan i think he from oxford that we need lot of uh, data on uh, you know what's the impact on climate ch- change uh, in countries like india we have seen lot of floods and you know himalayan region melting of ice is also one of the big concerns because majority of fresh water comes from there so the the biggest think tanks in eu uk the scientific data knowledge exchange uh, technology 
uh, transfer and risk mitigation strategies, this all would help. Yes. Please. All right. Thank you, Navi. Yeah. Um, moving on to our next uh, panelist, we have uh, Mr. Marius Okel. Is he here? Yes, I'm here. Hello. <clears throat> Hi. Can you hear me? Good evening. Good evening. That's great. <laughs> yes, uh, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction and then you can take the floor. So uh, he's the head of Cluster International Association Partnership Africa and India, German Association of the Automotive industry. He leads the Indo-German Association Partnership Program between the Automotive Component Manufacturers Association of India, the Society of Indian Automobile Manufacturing. Uh, so this project funded by the German Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, the associations can successfully common interests such as electric mobility and renewable fuels for the automotive industry in both countries. He is responsible for organizing and coordinating conferences, workshops, joint research papers, and bilateral de delegations in the scope of the project. His main areas of expertise are the automotive industry in Germany and India, contacts relevant to OEMs, suppliers, and pol political decisions. On to you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so uh, starting my, my um, speech or my talk, I just wanted to thank you very much um, to your colleagues, Zujik and yourself for, for organizing the summit. And I, as part of the um, 2019 class, I really uh, like how this initiative is growing and how you can attract more and more members in the EU, India, UK field to, to really uh, touch upon topics and to connect to each other. So it's really great to see this evolving the initiative. And I think the speakers are also very great and insightful which you are able to to organize so um, speaking about climate change speaking about europe and india uh, what does come in mind i think it was very very interesting what uh, svenja Hahn also mentioned because she she put a big emphasis on the topic of cooperation and that's also what i would um, what i would emphasize here a lot because cooperation it's it's very important it's not an against each other it's more a with each other between Europe and India. And that's what we also have to ensure for the future. And I think we are, we as the VDA, as the German Automotive Industry Association, we are very much engaged in India because we see that there's the future potential, but there's also future potential, not only as a market, but also for, for collaboration and for ensuring climate protection for the whole world. And that's why we deep dive within our association partnership with our Indian counterparts, ACMA and Siam, into various topics coming from electric mobility, going into hydrogen, going also in safety and fuel standards to, to, make the, to, to make the environment and the cars cleaner at the end, to do something good for the protection of the environment. And that's, that's what we are focusing on. And what I think is, is very interesting to, to touch is the, the kind of cooperation because from our side, from, from German automotive industry side, we right now sometimes have the feeling that uh, Indian regulation, we have this uh, new self-reliant India topic, um, which sometimes, which has the approach to, to get India more self-reliant and so on and to get more local production and more local value chain, value added chain, which is all good and all totally understandable. But from our side, it goes sometimes a little bit, um, let's say, too quick. And sometimes the second step is a little bit um, done before the first step. So that's why where we really want to emphasize the cooperation, um, that it, it must go hand in hand together with European, with the German companies um, to see where, where, we can, where we can manage the, the um, potential and where we can see cooperation. And for this, I want to highlight also one aspect where um, what Svenja Hahn from the European Parliament mentioned. It's about the free trade agreement. We still think that there's a lot of um, potential, but also interest to really to really engage, to enhance trade. And this at the end really can bring us um, or can lead us also to climate protection again, that um, some technologies will easier flow from Europe to India if they are demanded there. 
um, if the trade is eased between two our two let's say continents nations how you went to our two regions let's say mm -hmm. um, so maybe this as, as, a, as a start and I think from from VDA German automotive industry said it's it's very clear that we aim at a speedy and substantial reduction of greenhouse gas emissions on the pathway towards a clean climate neutral economy in 2050 so that's our all goal and you know that we have the EU um, Green Deal coming up now, so it's it's also very much uh, interesting for for German companies to to engage in this. I hope that okay. was yeah. Yeah. So um, just adding on to it, so what uh, which technologies do you see <laughs> emerging for reaching the climate targets? Yeah, it, it, it's quite interesting. Like from from our perspective, it's it's clear that climate protection costs money and requires effort in terms of investment and innovation. But we are very much sure that this um, that this money is well spent. Um, so this goes right now in the direction that we um, that we see evolving electric mobility for sure. And it's it's quite interesting because also Euro the European regulators they 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 bring us to the to the field that it, it may only that definitely electric mobility is taking up. And uh, when we see this as part of the European Green Deal, we have with the Green Deal, it, it represents the most ambitious climate protection effort um, with far reaching uh, implications right now in the in the whole world. So this is where an industry will adapt. But we always say that it, it it's still it's it's technology neutral. Like the approach should be technology neutral. So the, the government they can they can do restrictions and they can say okay this should be the way how we how we want to have the the pollution side and how we want to have the greenhouse gases and let the industry see how it how it reaches this and um, coming also into this direction I mean there was I think three years ago the Indian minister um, for for uh, traffic and road safety I think he said okay we we just want to be 100% electric in three years. Um, which is actually not that quick possible because sometimes you also need some leap time and you need to, to put in, in account some other um, aspects as well. And we we are in favor of, for, for hydrogens as well, for e-fuels. So we are in favor of reaching the climate goals, but let the industry see case by case how to, how to reach it. Okay. So... Um... You know, how is the automotive industry contributing to the climate protection then? Yeah, it's it's actually a lot. I mean, when you when you see the um, when you see the targets um, we have to fulfill, um, and the, the first things they have to be fulfilled in 2022. They had to be fulfilled. Um, sorry, 2020, and this all worked out for our uh, big OEMs to to fulfill this. So it's also going to be hopefully the same in the future that it's possible to to even fulfill this and we think like when you when you see the automotive industry as a as a part in the whole global value chain also also looking into india that it's there's so many investments like what what german automotive industry spends in research and development to really make cars cleaner and greener that it's um yeah, it's 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 something what really uh, what really moves people at the end but what also moves climate protection if the if the emissions fall and also some new things coming up like automated driving, maybe driverless uh, uh, driving and um, some city mobility and so on. It will all hopefully foster uh, foster climate protection. Okay, so uh, one of our previous panelists had also mentioned that you know. Um, we can't really have a one-fits-all solution. So what is your opinion about that? Yes, that's, that's totally true. I think it was something also a little bit lined out in the, in the question um, or two questions before that it's, it's every, every regulation must take into account the local, local requirements. So I, I think we cannot say globally, okay, every electric car is totally climate neutral. Once if the energy, energy comes out of coal, for example, it's not easily climate neutral, so it must take into account the local local um, uh, local requirements, local um, considerations, and hence it's not easy to say just one solution fits all. So it needs to be adapted. And what we 
also say that uh, any new climate targets must allow for, for new possibilities for their attainment. So in road transport, it is crucial to provide defor defossilization options for the existing vehicle fleet, such as synthetic fuels, as they provide an additional reduction potential to measures aiming not only at fleet renewal. Electrification and the defossilization of combustion engines must go hand in hand. So what, what do we mean by this? It's not just if you if we say, okay, let's go all electric, all countries, it's, it's great, but or it's, it's, it's one approach, but with this, we don't, what we sometimes forget is the, the overall fleet. So if you say, okay, we also target the energy, like the, the fuel by itself and see that this is CO2 neutral due to renewable fuels as, and, and so on, I think we might have a little bit more um, more like a, a broader, broader approach. So not only focus on the new cars, also focus on the already existing fleet. Okay, thanks. So like we know that uh, people are being more aware right now with the kind of choices they are having with, mm. with the automobiles. You know, you do see a lot of people moving towards electric cars and all. You do see a lot of people having a lot of electric, you know, bikes right now. So mm -hmm. cars are something that people are moving towards. So, you know, people are becoming more conscious on the roads right now towards the environment. So, you know, that's a great approach. So do we have any questions for the panelists? My uh, question to uh, Marius would be, how soon can we see a flying car come in? Because that can be a big motivator. For uh, the lower rate of uh, electric cars, lower rate of carbon components and stuff. Yeah. Marius, you're at the front end of research. That, that's a good question. Um, actually, I think there have been some some trials for flying cars, but mm -hmm. sometimes I'm really asking myself, do we want to have flying cars all over the cities? I don't know how this may look at the end, but um, I know that <laughs> there's some research and development coming into this, but I, I don't see it in the next five years that everyone owns a flying car, to be honest. <laughs> but you may, uh, anyone, uh, I want, also wanted to make some advertisement. Uh, we have our new IAA mobility show, which is like somehow the biggest mobility show in the world coming up in Munich, organized by VDA this September. So if anyone is interested and uh, it's in Europe anyway, so please feel free to visit us. There might also be flying cars. <laughs> Thank so you. Arun, you can come and join us. Sure, Marius. Do we have more questions? Yeah. Hey, hey Marius. Oh, sorry, yes, did I interrupt you? No, it's... I think uh, I have a co-panelist, so... I yeah, yeah, I know. You have a fair chance to ask a question I, I can ask later. I wanted to ask... No, no, go ahead, Naveen. No, let's, let's do it now. Okay. Okay. Hey, Marius, wie geht es dir? Sehr gut, danke schön. Sprichst du Deutsch? Yeah, I have in, uh, in Stuttgart studied in the University of Stuttgart. Ah, that's true. in Munich, uh, then. Auto yeah. show in Frankfurt auch. Ah, very good, yeah. That is our show, right. organized by VDA, the big IAA show, perfect. Wunderbar, wunderbar. Okay, so my question is, uh, you know, more of, uh, uh, you know, I'm a passionate auto guy. Uh, yeah. So, by when I think uh, Germany want to be completely electric, uh, you think you do have a, Angela Merkel did give a target that all the autos uh, will be turned electric. By when is it? By twenty? No, that's um, from my side happily not not uh, not true. There is no no target such uh, such like this. So it, it was sometimes under discussion, but we. We never had the target that there should be um, like 100% electric. It is still sometimes under political consideration, but it's also coming to like this election fight that there's some like uh, the Green Party. They say, okay, 2030, we want we don't want to have any internal combustion engines anymore in new cars. But still, I think as now it's also a, a lot of research going into e-fuels, uh, going into hydrogen. So it, I, I would say the story is not not over yet and. Um, I mean, also when you look at, I mean, uh, why are the electric cars that successful right now in Germany? Because also we have an environmental bonus paid by the German taxpayer for 9,000 euros per electric car, which is bought. So 
I don't know if this bonus is not there anymore in 2025, it's, it's going to be stopping. Um, let's see how this goes. And still, I mean, electric cars are way more expensive than just internal combustion cars. So also the people somehow need to, to afford individual mobility. And that's also a case what we saw right now in the Corona pandemic. I mean, the, the interest into still, again, going with the car and owning a car, it, it's much higher because the, the public transport, it's a little bit decreases due to, I don't know, safety for, for viruses and so on. So that's, that's the story, but you are right. It's, it's popping every some months. It's popping up that we should forbid all the, um, I don't know, all the combustion engine cars. So let's see. And um, but there is no official decision on that. <laughs> Why don't you come to India? We will manufacture a cheaper car for you, electric vehicle. Yeah, I know you. You tried with the Tata Nano, <laughs> but uh, this is now out of stock. <laughs> I have a couple of times no, in India, actually, electric. but like before the pandemic came. You might be surprised that India has come with the world's best car uh, in electric, Nexon. Have you heard of it? Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I, I know that, that was just a bad joke. I know that India is it's pushing a lot for electric vehicles. And it's also, I mean, I visited Auto Expo New Delhi last year. It was my last travel before the pandemic hit and a lot of investments going into electric and a lot of research and quite well outcomes. In fact, I was actually uh, at the when in 2010 the energy concept 2050 was released in 2009-10. So yeah. at that time, I was working on the uh, the car climate neutral things in Stuttgart. So do you think is it okay? Uh, is it now we are on the right path that uh, energy concept will be implemented by 2050 for Germany? I assume so. We have the pathways uh, are aligned to to do it in, until 2050 and. Uh, still, Germany puts a lot of research into into hydrogen uh, as well, and I, I think for this we need global partnerships as well. Hydrogen, um, it's it's quite interesting to to see in the as well to North Af North Africa um, that we also need to find the sources for for clean hydrogen as well. So I think Germany and Europe we need partnerships to really um, yeah to get to get the energy and the sources clean and at the end to get our transportation clean and. I think it's the same applying for India too. Yeah. So I think Sujit is there to bring more partnerships. You should tell him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. So the way we plan that out. Off with us in. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. That's perfect. <laughs> um, Do we have more questions? I think we are kind of running behind time as well. No, I, yeah, I think there's no more questions. We already ran off, ran out of time. But thank right. you. Yeah, thank you, Marius, for uh, flying cars and battery. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> thank you for inviting. Yeah, yeah, a pleasure. Um, I think Priya, you can conclude, and then it will give uh, the word of thanks. So um, the overall objective is to you know, support efforts towards uh, sustainable growth and to build mutual understanding on uh, global environmental issues, uh, including climate change, of course. And given the very welcoming policies and measures already and ones in the pipeline, I'm sure that we will have more and more occasions to enhance our cooperation, to jointly combat the global challenge of climate change and its impact in India, European Union, the UK and the world. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.